الله وكفى على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون صلّى الله العظيم وصل رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين Honorable Ulema Ikram, from Ikram, respected elders and brothers, dear viewers and listeners, in tonight's recital we completed the 27th juz of the Qur'an. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has afforded us, alhamdulillah, to recite the Qur'an on a regular basis, especially in the month of Ramadan. Where in this particular juz, various different chapters consist in it. And we begin from yesterday, which we started continuing in today's uh, Tarawi. Some of the selected verses which I would like to choose from, and that is the highlight of this particular Tarawi, tonight's Tarawi, is وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That alone itself, number one, why have we been created? Why have we been sent down to this world? And what is our purpose? of living in this world. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created us for play, for pleasure, for luxury, for health, for wealth. He has created us for worship, for ibadah. Until and unless we will not connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're not going to see all those things coming into our life. Health, wealth, pleasure, luxury, uh, home, so forth. Those are the things that will not come into our life because we are not connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But our connection depends on these things. Our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll only get these aspects of things of life, which is the worldly affairs in our life, until and unless our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala somehow, some way, becomes strong. We can do it in various different forms and ways. We can do it right now in the month of Ramadan, whilst we are actually passing through. But why are we delaying? Why are we holding back? Why are we still contemplating? Why are we still thinking that I'm going to do this? I mean, we, we thought about it from the very beginning when it was the first of Ramadan. That I will do this, I will do that. Have we done it? Have we accomplished it or not? That's, that's the question we need to ask ourselves. I mean, it's pointless saying, I, I'm going to do it. Inshallah, when I get time to do it, I will do it. But you always say, I am going to do it. Not accomplishing that thing. And that is connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what we have to do in the last couple of days that we have. These are the vital moments that we have. I mean, alhamdulillah, the two brothers, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them jazakhir, they're sitting in sunnah tika. If there's any connection, it is them. Subhanallah. Because they have given their time, their health, their wealth, their luxury, their business, everything to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I want to give it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these last 10 days, I'm going to make sure I focus and somehow I reignite that spark that would have been, that should have been ignited a long time ago. They know, ask themselves. They can ask themselves that question as well. That should have been reignited a long time ago. But it's an opportunity. They decided that we're going to sit in Itikaf. And by us sitting in Itikaf, will have a greater opportunity to reignite that spark, to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is up to us. You know, sometimes we like, we like a mobile phone, we're looking for reception. The moment we don't get it, it's a black spot. So I can't be in that area because it's a black spot, I can't get reception. That's the same way. Me and you, this Ramadan, we like the reception of a mobile phone. We'll move around till we get connected. And these uh, individuals who have sat in Ertigar, their reception is absolutely strong. We're not just talking of one or two bars, but it's absolutely full. Because they're directly connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the least, I would say, let's go up to those individuals, ask them, please make dua for me and my family. May Allah forgive us 
and the little that you know I have done in the month of Ramadan. Because they are the most fortunate ones. Those who are sitting in the Ittika, the, the Sunnah Ittika. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for worship. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amazingly He says the same thing for the jinn kind. There is accountability for them as well. As we spoke regarding when we had the, the topic regarding the jinns itself, even them as well, the accountability for their actions, what they do, they will be accountable for. Just like how me and you are accountable for every action that we will do, so, so they, they will be accounted for as well. On the day of Qiyamah, just as we will rise and stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will also have to rise and stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give accountability for their good and their evil actions. So Allah has created us and them for the purpose of worship. Moving on further, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next chapter after Wattu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Wannajmi Ida Hawa speaks about regarding how they intrigue and how they actually question the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as they would say, oh, this Muhammad, he just speaks out of his own free will. So Allah cleared the air and he said, Wannajmi Ida Hawa ma dalla sahibukum wa ma gawa wa ma yantiku anil hawa in huwa illa wahyu yuha. The Prophet وسلم, does not speak out of his own free will or own desire, but revelation comes upon him and that's where he conveys the message. And how many times the Prophet وسلم, told them, how many times, on numerous occasions, the Prophet وسلم, told the Mushrikeen of Makkah and he told them that this is not my words, these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they were intrigued by the words of the Qur'an. And when the Prophet ﷺ would recite it, amazingly, they will be captured by awe and they would say, no, absolutely no. This book or this man, what he's speaking, before obviously, the words, this book, or this, this man, the words that he's saying, that is Muhammad ﷺ, he is no poet. And amazingly, the beautiful incident of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu when, when it became so difficult to propagate deen in Makkah al Mukarramah, he decided to leave Makkah al Mukarramah and go somewhere else where he could worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There, there was a man by the name of Ibn Daghina who came to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and halted him and said, Abu Bakr, where are you off to? A man like you with so much honesty, a man like you truthful, how can you leave Makkah al Mukarramah? So he grabbed Abu Bakr anhu and he took Abu Bakr anhu and he said, Don't worry Abu Bakr, you are now in my amnesty. You are under my protection, nobody will hassle you. Go and worship your Allah. Abu Bakr anhu was Abu Bakr. Nobody can be like this man. Amazingly. Abu Bakr anhu, you know, again, seeing the Quran being revealed, being with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he would recite the Qur'an, he would cry profusely. But then when he would recite the Qur'an in such a melodious voice, he would attract the women and the children whom they would come and they would listen to the words of the Qur'an recited by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. The mushrikeen of Makkah feared that our women and children will accept Islam. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he started reciting the Qur'an aloud. So the people started and they came to complain to Ibn Daghina that this man is under your protection, he's under your amnesty. Why is it, why don't you tell him, why is he reciting the Quran aloud? So Ibn Daghina came to Abu Bakr anhu and he said, Abu Bakr, don't make my matters difficult for me. As it is, I'm under social pressure, I'm under domestic pressure, and here you're reciting the Quran aloud. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu told Ibn Daghina, here I give you your amnesty, I give you your protection. Allah's protection and his Rasul's protection is sufficient for me. Those are the words of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. The amnesty and the protection of Allah and his Rasul is far more than enough for me. That was the true love for the Quran. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had. And that's the same thing that needs to be transmitted into our lives. Like I said, 
There was a time amongst the Sahaba, the one who couldn't cry, he felt odd. Today in our, in our congregation, the one that cries, why is this man crying? Why have you lost someone? Somebody died? So that man is he's crying because of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being recited. It's being touched into his heart. It's being transmitted. It's being again, you know, into his heart. And yet, me and you will start questioning the brother, are you, are you feeling okay? You know, if someone has passed away, he is crying because the words of Allah are so unreal. And he is actually taking it. And the beauty of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he's crying. Like I said, the one that doesn't cry amongst the Sahaba, he was odd. Because amongst the Sahaba, they would cry profusely when they would recite the Quran or when they would hear the words of the Quran. Today, how many times, how much of the Quran has been recited in, in Tarawih Salah? How many sincerely can, can even ask themselves that uh, I cried because of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Whether I understand them or not, we have this biggest barrier that I don't understand the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then how do you think that child will memorize the Quran? Does he understand every single word of the Quran? He can barely understand what is Alhamdulillah, but he has memorized the entire Quran from cover to cover. And he hasn't understood a single thing. And I mentioned last time the incident of uh, Shaykh Abdul Basit when he went to Egypt, when he went to, uh, uh, when he went to the Zionist, uh, not the Zionist, he went to um, Russia at that time. It was the Soviet Union. And when he recited, Taha ma anzalna alayk al Quran li tashqa. They didn't, they didn't understand a single word, but they were absolutely taken, they were absolutely riveted. They were taken aback as to how, why, why are you crying? We don't know why we are crying. It's just these words this man is reciting making us cry. So when, when was the last time we actually cried? Because the words of Allah was being recited. So again, brothers, we need to see the month of Ramadan is going. Let's capture those moments. So that was the love of the Quran through Sahaba Ikram Allah There are many, many incidents. So that's in relation. And then further on in the next surah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the splitting of the moon. Where they obviously they, they told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Mushrikin of Bakr, they don't worry, why don't you show us a miracle that you are the Prophet of Allah? And then just it happened to be so, they said, okay, why don't you split this moon in half? The Prophet reassured that if I split this moon in the half, would you accept Islam? No problem, no problem, we accept. But the problem is, is after seeing it, they still did not accept the message of Allah, of Allah and His Rasul. They did not accept the message of the Prophet. The Prophet split the moon. In fact, the Mufassirun have written that the moon did not split for a little split second. But in fact, it went to such an extent that one half of the moon went one side of Makkah, the other half of the moon went to the other side of Makkah. That's how it split. And then it was put back together. Yet, they did not accept the message of the Prophet We may be thinking that, I mean, how wretched these people are. But really, realistically speaking, let's do this. If we were in their shoes, would we accept the message of the Prophet yeah, we can say very casually, yes, I will, because we are Muslims, we are born Muslims today, or we've been reverted to Islam. But I'm saying, those are the very same people who grew up with the Prophet Those are the very same people who seen the Prophet grow up, because he was known as the truthful, al amin the trustworthy one. And yet, when the Prophet was granted prophethood, these are the very same people who trusted the Prophet they even said he's an Amin, trustworthy, honesty, and yet the very same people who called him those names rejected and negated the message of the Prophet So sometimes we need to reflect and contemplate. We as Muslims, we have become absolutely careless because for us, we are like, okay, I'm a Muslim, so I'm going to go into Jannah. We've become complacent, that's the correct word. Absolutely complacent. 
That because we are born Muslims, so we're gonna be, we're gonna have a free ticket to ent entry into Jannah. No, 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 no. There's nothing of that kind. We have to obviously Jannah is worthwhile. So you have to make your life worthwhile in, on the face of this earth. That means make ibadah in order for you to be granted into Jannah. So it is our responsibility. You know, it's easy to say, but if I if I was in the time of the Prophet, if I was there, I would have accepted his message. It's easy to say it right now. But it's very difficult to do it at that moment in time. Because your Iman has to be absolutely strong in order to accept the message of Muhammad These are the very same people who are rigid, who are very, very staunch on the religion of their forefathers. They would not move from the religion of their forefathers. But here the Prophet he shook the stones, where, meaning he shook the hearts of those, those people who then later on accepted Islam their hearts were made out of stone where nothing would be able to penetrate through. But here when the words of Muhammad came out and the words of the Quran, it immediately penetrated into the hearts. The life of Uthman ibn Affan, how he accepted Islam. The life of uh, how Abu Bakr, yes, he was a good friend of the Prophet prior to prophethood, but he also accepted, uh, he also accepted Islam right away. The various other Sahaba. <coughs> Look at the, how Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu accepted this time. As rigid as he was, as annoying, I mean, he found the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to be a very, a nuisance, a disturbance to the religion. And here Umar said, you know what, let me put an end to, end to this man right away. Because if I'm going to put an end to him, then I know that, okay, Islam won't be able to flourish anymore. From where to where, on the, on the verge of assassinating Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he ended up in the lap of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepting Islam. So again, this is just a reminder of how the Sahaba Ikram Ridwan Allah alayhi wa sallam accepted Islam. Moving on further, we recite the Surah Al-Rahman, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the various ni'mats, the various blessings and barakat. Allah speaks about rivers, trees, orchards. Allah speaks about all the aspects, and then every time he speaks, are you still gonna are you still gonna question? Are you still gonna belie me? Are you still gonna question the fact that who created this? So Allah repetition. So every time that's a, to show us that you can why are you gonna belie Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you can see outside everything happens with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And moving on to the next surah, which is Surah Al-Waqi'ah. Now, Surah Al-Waqi'ah is an amazing surah. Allah speaks about Jannah, the whore, the women of Jannah. Allah speaks about that as well. But something noteworthy, this is what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, on his deathbed, Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, came up to him and he said, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, what can I get for you? Can I get for you any food? So he said, no, no need for that. Can I get you a doctor? He goes, no, no, absolutely. You know, a doctor makes me ill. So no need of that. So he said, can I, you know, can I give you money from Baytul Mal? From, from, you know, from the treasury. So Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu said, no, no, I'm not in need of that. So Uthman radiallahu anhu said, maybe your daughters are in need of it. <coughs> so Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu says, absolutely no. My daughters will never see hunger or poverty reaching them. Because I have taught them a surah which the Prophet wasallam said, that individual who recites Surah Al-Waqi'ah after Maghrib Salah, daily basis, poverty will not reach that home. Poverty and penury. How many of us can very say diligently that we sit down as a family, each one of us, son, daughter, mother, father, reciting Surah Al-Waqi'ah and have seen poverty in their life. This is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu is narrating this incident that the, prior to his passing away, the, in, the conversation he had with Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. So again, brothers, it's an opportunity that we sit down every day after Maghrib Salah. I know there's very little time, especially in the month of Ramadan, but this habit should begin from today 
and ensuring that it continues after Ramadan. That each one of us, just like it is a compulsory, mandatory for each one of us, that before we leave the home, the son, the daughter, the father, the mother, before having breakfast, they recite Surah Yasin, that Allah grants barakah, gives, gives them protection throughout the day, Allah saves them from different calamity and catastrophe. Likewise, the same thing, the moment we have come back from a long day's work, we are tired, we are lethargic, we are, we are absolutely exhausted, that we can sit down and after Salatul Maghrib, before having our dinner, we sit down and each one of us, father, mother, daughter, son, sit down together and they recite Surah al -Waqia. This is what the Prophet said, not myself, that poverty and penury will never reach at home. But there's an opportunity, let us do, let us recite it. Let us make sure that we, we are in a habit. But in fact, that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says that I have made my daughters memorize that surah. So we should make our sons and our daughters memorize surah al -Waqi'ah. It may take one or two months to memorize the surah, but let me tell you, it is a lifelong gift which you can give to your children and yourself. Poverty and penury will not reach that home. We're always complaining for money, right? We're always complaining, oh, we don't have enough money. Oh, we don't have this. But recite Surah al waqiah Allah is guaranteeing you that. So it's an opportunity, brothers. Let's take hold of this opportunity and use it for our own advantage. We make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gives us the true understanding of deen. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين